to be here, and I'm very grateful for having been invited by the um, uh, committee running this uh, series. Um, being a native uh, speaker of German, actually, and a non-native speaker of English, uh, I always get a lot of heat from my daughters that I'm not really able to pronounce the name of our foremost president and the name giver of this city properly. There's something about silent L's in front of N's that German talks to So um, I'll be happy to be here to take some additional training and that makes my daughters happy when they come back. I'm also really grateful to be here finally because uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, this is my second book on Walter Benjamin, the aesthetics of politics in the late 90s, was published by the uh, University of Nebraska Press. Um, and, uh, in spirit, I've been here quite a bit because some of my little baby was born here, but uh, I've never made it here, so it's really great to finally come, come to the site and um, to see where, where it saw the light of the day. Um, Marco mentioned um, I'm working on two projects, and what I want to present you tonight is, in fact, sort of at the intersection uh, of uh, both of these projects. Um, can't actually quite decide to which project it belongs. Um, and uh, both of them have to do with questions of speed and slowness and deceleration in contemporary filmmaking and uh, artistic practice. In general, sort of tweaking some notions of uh, speed and slowness there, I don't want to go into detail there, but you might wonder sort of what this issues of slowness of deceleration um, have to do at a lecture podium that wants to address questions of humanities at the edge. <laughs> and uh, isn't that ill suited? Well, in the larger context of that study, but also as I want to argue tonight, the art cinema, as well as the humanities in general, in my particular understanding, sort of are at their best whenever actually they position themselves at the edge of time. And what I and my two projects actually consider slowness as a kind of strategy that uh, seeks to position us at the edge of time to make us pause, to make us hesitate to commit the kind of speeds that mark our present, to make us hesitate to kind of think <coughs> and ponder about the nature of time in the first place, to make us think about progress a little harder and develop various notions of where we might want to go from here. So I consider it as one of the principal tasks, actually, of the humanities to engage us in these kind of debates about the nature of time and history, not just to sort of look back at the past and look at all the riches there might be that we can draw on in order to make our, our present meaningful, but actually in order to discuss alternate paths into the future, not just be pushed into the future by certain kinds of logics of automatic progress. So the humanities, in a way, are always already an effort at the edge of time. And you'll see that uh, I will do something with Werner Herzog tonight, too, that situates him at this edge of time. I'll talk for about, let's say, about 40 to 45 minutes, but I'm very eager to afterwards hear your comments and uh, sort of engage uh, in the discussion of the material I want to present here. Let's, do you want to put the, turn the microphone on? I, like, I suspect that maybe some... Is it on? It's at the bottom, yeah. Isn't it the bottom? Oh, yeah. Okay. There, oh, there yeah. we go. I should have noticed. Sorry. <clears throat> the historiography of storage and display media abounds with tales of evolutionary progress and epics of patrilineal succession. Photography, we are told, provided the seeds for the arrival of cinema. The new iPad's retina display radically advances the, sharp, uh, radically advances the sharpening of electronic images established by iPad 1 and iPad 2. Today's computing, we are told, unifies various legacies of data storage, visual animation, and distributed communication. As these common tales suggest, Scholars and critics love to think of media and display history in terms of a teleological enterprise, leading from infancy to maturity, from childhood to old age, with one stage of technological development fathering the next, and with later stages offering more refined, more immersive, more perfect versions of past configurations. In some of these scenarios, we may allow for unforeseen divorces, or even mighty Oedipal revolts. Some media, as we tell their stories, get displaced unfairly by others. 
while other media kill their fathers upon arrival. Yet the overall unplotment of media and display history follows a fairly limited cause and effect pattern. That is a deterministic narrative in whose context past events merely prefigure present achievements, and future change is primarily imagined as the continuation or improvement of what we have today. The surge of 3D film releases in recent years has predominantly been promoted in such terms of biological maturing and evolutionary perfection. In its efforts to lure spectators away from tiny cell phone screens and multiply framed YouTube windows, 3D has been advertised as a means to expand the affective power of cinema by synthesizing moving image and virtual reality technologies and thus complete what ordinary cinema itself no longer seems to deliver, immersive pleasure and ecstatic movement. Jake Sully, the hero of James Cameron's Avatar, is 3D's most iconic flag bearer. When he, for the first time, explores his new virtual body, first stumbling and hopping, and then running and relishing the joy of transcending his physical constraints, <coughs> he performs and allegorizes what 3D is meant to be all about, namely to displace an inhibited past with a more animated and blissful present. 3D promises to resituate cinema's fourth wall, and like surround sound, push cinematic representation beyond the screen's limit. 3D, in fact, pledges to entertain viewers with the conversion of the screen into what new media culture has come to understand as a fully transparent interface, a zone of physical contact at which machines and users meet each other and engage in mutual exchanges. In its effort to fold the viewer into the space of the view, viewed, 3D today <coughs> thus poses as a perfect training ground, not only for a present in which digital screens have become both mobile and ubiquitous, but also for spectators eager to sense pixels and code in all their materiality. Presented as the child of both traditional cinema and the ordinary desktop computer, 3D display is expected to complete what its parents are no longer able to carry out, to overcome spectatorial disbelief and thereby bring cinema's quest for illusionism to a logical conclusion. The aim of my presentation tonight is to explore not only a different employment of 3D representation, but thereby also to envision an alternate way of mapping media history, one largely free of biological <coughs> or teleological metaphors, one open to contingency and discontinuity, one eager to read history against the brain, and precisely thus open the door for alternate futures. The focus of my argument will be on Werner Herzog's recent 3D essay film, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, in which Herzog approaches the drawings of the Chauvet Cave so as to reconsider the ontology of cinematic medium and ponder about certain ruptures and continuities between the earliest signs of human artistic production and our own present and future. Similar to the way in which rock artists 30,000 years ago considered walls as membranes from which to release animated images, Hatzog presents 3D cinematography as a medium of heightened attentiveness that has the potential to move viewers beyond the confines of the conventional screening frame <coughs> and causal narrative. Parietal art, in Hatzog's perspective, can teach contemporary and future film audience a lesson or two about the art of embodied looking. It embodies the temporality of beholding that repudiates the restless rhythms of today's visual culture. At first, it is tempting to think of Hatzog's descent into Paleolithic darkness as an endeavor to unearth the archetypical and timeless, a decisive turn away from the present into some prehistoric past and otherness. Yet the wager of my presentation today is to present Hatzog's cave cinema as a cinema of potentiality and futurity as an effort to engage the viewer in a media archaeological exercise able to uncover cinema's unclaimed pasts and forgotten futures. <coughs> Most prominent, prominently defined by Erki Gusamo, <coughs> the academic field of media archaeology seeks to construct, and I quote, 
alternate histories of suppressed, neglected, and forgotten media that do not point teleologically to the present media cultural condition as their perfection. Dead ends, losers, and inventions that never made it into a material product have important stories to tell." End quote. As he explores the dreams and caves of seemingly distant times, Herzog aspires to construct such an ultimate history. His primary goal is no less than to bring cinema's historically suppressed potentiality to life again. What is at the center of his inquiry is to expand cinema by activating the proto-cinematic aspects of dreams and parietal art, and mobilize these against how dominant film culture has coupled 3D to the telling of teleologically integrated tales. By exploding the quadrilateral flatness of the cinematic image, Hatzog's media archaeology wants us to relearn how to see with our senses and to sense our seeing. He invites viewers to experience cinema as both a past and a future site of fluid, sensuous transactions and open-ended physical voyages. What my presentation will call Hatzog's cave cinema, then, is a cinema of phenomenological attractions and display in which vision exceeds the optical, and viewers are not subjected to the linear drive of narrative progress. Cave cinema is dedicated to expanding display and moving image culture, and thus enable viewers to encounter their present not as a rapid succession of highly fragmented images, but as a meeting ground of contingent <coughs> meanings and layered durations. As it reframes some of the oldest expressions of humankind, Cave Cinema asks us to take time, to behold of multiple times at once, so as to rework our bodily relation to the filmic world and its temporality, decelerate our perceptual processes, our ways of seeing, and precisely thus open a window to the future as a site of open possibilities. The exploration of other states of consciousness, dreams, visions, hallucinations, has been at the heart of Werner Herzog's work as a film director ever since the late 1960s. Think of Herzog's use of hypnosis in Heart of Glass of 1976, the depiction of colonial madness in Aguirre, The Wrath of God, 1972, the mirages and apparitions of Fata Morgana, 1972 or the delusions, deliria, megalomanias, and prophetic stances of Hatzog's protagonist in later feature films such as Fitzgeraldo, 1982, Cobra Verde, 1987, and The Wild Blue Yonder, 2005, and in documentaries such as Bells from the Deep, 1993, and Grizzly Man, 2005. In Cave of Forgotten Dreams, Hatzog's quest for what Greg Prager has called Hatzog's pursuit of aesthetic ecstasy and truth takes on a new dimension as we follow the director into the Chauvet Cave in southern France and ruminate about the origins of human art and spiritualism around 30,000 years ago. Discovered in 1994, Chauvet contains by far the oldest cave paintings and carvings known today. It was shut to the public soon after its discovery for reasons of preservation. Ever since, only highly select teams of scientists and humanists have been granted access to the site to research the case extraordinary rock art and bring light into the mysteries surrounding its <laughs> being. In all likelihood, Hansok's descent into the cave will remain the only extended filmic document of the cave's parietal art for some time to come, a film redeeming the past in all its obscurity for an unknown future. The Chauvet Cave, Hansok ponders at some early point in the film, quote, is like a frozen flash of time, end quote. It presents, he says, a perfect time capsule, end quote. But from the film's very first shot, it is clear that Hatzik's trip to southern France is not simply about showcasing a remote past for modern eyes of consumption. Instead, Cave of Forgotten Dreams wants to be at once a meditation about the prehistorical and spiritual origins of image production, and an attempt to explore past artistic practices as a resource to expand cinema beyond its historically developed, uh, uh, historically developed language and modes of looking. Hatzog's quest, in other word, words, is to tap into the long durée of forgotten pasts so as to complicate 
what we today should consider an image in the first place. To be sure, scholars of cave art have still not found one conclusive answer about why people about 30,000 years ago descended into the darkness of interior spaces in order to engrave, scratch, paint, and draw images on rock walls. Dominant accounts refer to shamanism, to apotropaic visualization, and to a quasi-genetic need for aesthetic self-expression in order to explain what inspired acts of prehistoric image making in the flickering light of torches. But there's little agreement about the exact psychological and social function of early cave art, let alone whether we should consider Paleolithic markings as art in the first place. Hatzog's films ask, asks a handful of scholars to articulate their positions regarding this matter. But in the end, he neither seeks to take his sides in current scholarly debates, nor to come down with one coherent view of what caused Paleolithic people to engage in image making. His most important aim lies somewhere else, to explore prehistoric caves as forgotten media, whose images can move viewers beyond dominant forms of cinematic projection, and whose dreams question how both commercial cinema and media history have made us understand time as a linear, teleologically and tightly integrated progression from A to Z. Not long into the film, Hatzak allows us for the first time to behold of Chauvet's perhaps most iconic images, a panel depicting the heads of four horses, their eyes all directed to the left, their shapes neatly set against each other in such a way that we cannot escape the impression of forward movement. As in various later encounters, Hatzak's camera he already seeks to accentuate the image's stunning efforts to represent motion. He captures the deliberate flickering of artificial illumination and tenderly pans across the walls so as to imprint the animal's intimated dash onto the viewer's <coughs> perceptual registers. For these Paleolithic painters, we hear Hatzak's voice over right before his camera begins to travel of a pair of bison fighting with each other, quote, the play of light and shadows from their torches could possibly have looked something like this. For them, the animals perhaps appeared moving, living, and growing. Hatzak's voice at once, here, at once speaks propodotically and deictically. It proceeds, points at, and in this way virtually summons what it then wants to show and prove to our eyes. It asks advanced 3D technology to learn from the past and invites us to see our own seeing as part of a much older practice of enchanted looking. Only seconds later, Hatzak's camera will identify the image of a single bison, its body painted with eight legs as if to embody, as Hatzak himself is eager to point out, almost a form of proto-cinema. Paleolithic painters, we are to conclude, as they allow the trembling light of their torches to energize the imagination, foreshadowed what scholars of our own times have often canonized as one of the crucial origins of cinema. Etienne Jules Marais' late 19th century desire to arrest individual aspects of specific movements within the unity of one and the same image. That's what painters thus speak to us across fundamental divisions of time. Their dreams and visions not only anticipate our own aspirations and technologies, they also have the power to deliver whatever appears past and frozen from the logic of deep time, to display the long durée of human history as something dynamic, as something that resonates through our own present and might open the door to alternate and unclaimed futures. Like the flickering of early film projectors, as they fuse separate still frames into captivating representations of movement, prehistoric cave painting in Hatzog's view drew makers and viewers alike into hallucinatory experiences of dynamic motion. Nowhere does this analogy become more explicit than when Hatzog, while urging one of the Chauvet researchers to med med meditate about the interplay of light, shadow, and bodily experience in early cave art, suddenly cuts to the Bojangles of Harlem sequence of George Stevens' Swing Time, 1936. The scene shows Fred Astaire, tap dancing in blackface on stage, his back mostly to the audience, his face and body primarily directed towards his own shadow, 
as it is being cast threefold on a giant screen at the back of the stage. In the course of Astaire's original number, the dancer's shadows gain increasing <coughs> independence from the actual body on the stage. They continue or supplement moves Astaire himself does not carry out on stage, thus not only multiplying the choreography's complexity, but also identifying the speed and virtuosity of Astaire's steps as media of intoxication, of out-of-body experiences, of a temporary suspension and transcendence of the real. At once meant as a replay and a flash forward, Hatzog's use of these uh, swing time uh, sequence is quite programmatic. It defines the proto-cinematic aspects of cave art in terms much more expansive than how we have come to accept cinema as a vehicle of realist illusion and integrated narrative time. As they allow the flickering play of light and shadow to intoxicate their own senses, Paleolithic painters anticipated a cinema very well able to transport mind and body into the unknown, to challenge the parameters of the real and invite the fantastic to enter its scene, to provide sensory experiences, not just consumable images, powerful enough to be and to become other. A stairs dance intoxicates itself with its own representation, and precisely thus allows representation to gain material presence and animated life in its own right. Cave artists dreamt such dreams long before cameras, projectors, and screens were able to call its still images to life. As much as they remind us of bodily pleasures that, like us stairs, move us far beyond the kind of thrills commercial cinema has come to offer its viewers since its emergence. In Herzog's cave cinema, the making and beholding of images fuses into one single dynamic in space, yet not in order to fancy states of absolute self-presence, but, as our stairs example indicates, to play with the possibility of living and encountering multiple rhythms, speeds, and temporalities at once. Prompted by Herzog towards the end of the film, French archaeologist Jean-Michel Jeunesse reflects about our senses' ability to inscribe memory and communicate it through mythology and music across history. To be human, in his view, is to resist the entropy of time and be able to trace and read layered traces of lived life against the stream of linear chronology. Figurative images must be seen as humanity's perhaps most effective tool for allowing past to communicate, uh, sorry, most effective tool of allowing past to communicate with their futures. And as Jeunesse is eager to conclude, pointing his finger directly at the camera, he just saw that, cameras like Herzog's clearly continue this mnemonic vision. At which point Hatzog cuts to an aerial shot to the banks of the Ardèche River, <coughs> right next to the entrance of the cave. We can identify three men standing next to the water, their faces directed at the camera. So you just saw one of them is Hatzog, another holds a bulky remote control in his hands. The camera moves smoothly towards the group, yet before reaching them, turns halfway around and catches a glimpse of the river and the majestic arch dominating the valley. Meanwhile, the soft humming of an electric rotor emanates from the soundtrack. The camera's eye then turns back to the group again, approaches the open hands of a man in the middle, and ends its approach in the dark cave of its catcher's gap grasp, with nothing to show and nothing for us to see in. The shot's self-reflexivity could hardly be trumped. What it reveals to the viewer is the work of a small helicopter camera taking pictures of its director as much as of its operator laying bar what made many earlier images of the film possible in the first place. And yet, as the helicopter's image fades into cavernous black, it also seems to return the viewer across the banks of time to the upper Paleolithic. Or better, to define prehistoric cave painters and advanced cinematographers as contemporaries, as being able to communicate through visionary images across history. Like a stare, Hatzog's film here turns onto itself to show and celebrate what the magic of human image making, according to Jeunesse, is all about. To complicate our maps of progress, uncover history's unconscious in the name of the future, and thereby reveal the dynamic co-temporality of media past and media present. Time to recall 
that one of the most influential Western conceptions of perception, truth, and the duality of body and mind, namely Plato's simile of the cave, not only shares its location with Hatzog's Cave of Forgotten Dreams, but has inspired generations of film theorists to conceptualize cinema as a powerful machine of fantasy production. In the work of so-called apparatus theorists of the 1970s, such as Jean-Louis Baudry, Plato's cave foreshadowed nothing less than the perceptual conditions of cinematic experience. The way in which both the womb-like darkness of the auditorium and the mechanical time of cinematic projection immobilize spectators so as to entertain them with captivating illusions. The way in which the dream screen of filmic representation, rather than merely helping to disseminate certain ideological perspectives, is ideological in its very institutional nature. As summarized by Thomas Elsess and Walter Hagner, in Baudry's rather tragic and highly deterministic view of the cinematic situation, and I quote, the specific setup of projection, screen, and audience, together with the centering effects of optical perspective and the focalizing strategies of filmic narration, all ensure our or conspire to transfix, but also transpose the spectator into a trance-like state in which it becomes difficult to distinguish between the out there and the in here." End quote. Replaying Plato's allegory, cinema's architecture of the gaze and Baudry's view renders reality checks impossible. It at once requires and produces spectatorial immobility and passivity in order to rework the viewer's psyche and make us complacent with the protocols of consumer capitalism. So much that theory. <laughs> Though both Herzog and Baudry see caves as sites foreshadowing the operations of cinematic looking, nothing could be more different than how they think about the medium's ability to move into the future. For Herzog, the lessons to be learned from pariah art are far too rich in order to reduce cinema, like Baudry, to primarily an optical and physically stagnant experience. In order to tease out these differences, let me briefly refer to what scholar David Lewis Willman in The Mind in the Cave writes about why people more than 30,000 years use sites of apparent sensory deprivation to produce, store, and communicate symbols. I quote, in their various stages of altered states, questers thought by sight and touch in the folds and cracks of the rock face, visions of powerful animals. It is as if the rock were a living membrane between those who ventured in and one of the lowest levels of the tiered cosmos. Behind the membrane lay a realm inhabited by spirit animals and spirits themselves. And the passages and chambers of the caves penetrated deep into that realm. End of this vertical end quote. Lewis Williams's notion of cave and rock as membranes are useful to emphasize the crucial difference between Hatzard's and Baudry's appropriation of cavernous spaces as allegories of cinema. Whereas for Baudry, the cave primarily figured as a model of how cinema structure, cinema structures of looking suture viewers into the regimes of both disembodied Renaissance perspective and passive consumption, for perhaps a prehistoric case foreshadowed the possibility of thinking and embracing cinema as a member, a skin or revolving door of manifold sensory and non-sensory transactions. Unlike Baudry, Herzog doesn't approach Chauvet's cave paintings as if they were mere, mere visual projections <coughs> onto fixed screens. Though the visible flickering of light and shadow clearly matters for our understanding of the act of making and beholding parietal art, cave painting for Herzog, as much as for Lewis Williams, is deeply haptic or somatic in nature. It reveals through the medium of touch what is considered within or behind the surface of the rock. And it invites the beholder to what media scholar Laura Marx has called in a different context, a sensuous response without abstraction. That is, I quote, a mimetic relationship between the perceiver and the sensuous object, which does not require an initial separation between perceiver and object mediated by representation. It doesn't take much to notice that Cave of Forgotten Dreams Bounds with references to all kinds of senses, touch, hearing, smell, in order to explore the possibilities of a past and future cinema whose sensuous transactions 
have the ability to move us beyond Baudry's rather restricted notion of perceptual immobility. As modeled on the Chauvet cave, Hatzog's expanded cinema is one in which screens function like skin. The flatness of projection is replaced by deep tactile space. Renaissance perspective no longer defines our entry point into what we experience as image. And perceiver and perceived, like rock and rock artists, can entertain mimetic relationships. That is, non hierarchical forms of reciprocity that liquefy the hardened boundaries between subject and object. Hatzog's repeated focus on a handprint found in various locations of the Chauvet cave and left, as scientific analysis has shown by a singular individual, communicates this modeling of somatic non representational forms of cinematic perception. Contrary to initial assumption, Hatzog's thrill about this handprint is not about his desire to identify a prehistoric prototype of bourgeois art's cult of the signature, than it is about documenting a long forgotten index of a, symbolic, a symbiotic relationship between flesh and rock, the human and the non-human, subject and object, the material and the spiritual. The meaning of the hand's imprint on the wall for Hatzog functions like a promissory note for telling a yet-to-be-realized cinema in which dominant notions of making and consuming, activity and passivity, proximity and distance no longer hold, because film will define sight, touch and movement <coughs> as mutually related. As it unsettles the integrity of the conventional cinematic frame, 3D projection is as close as one might get to this expanded cinema at this point. But all things told, the viewer's 3D experience remains only an allegorical abbreviation of what is proto-cinematic, and as it turns out, anti-platonic about the art of the Chauvet cake, the promise of a promise. As envisioned by Hatzog then, prehistoric caves not only Caves not only simply represent sites of cinema before film, but models to expand cinema beyond its historical evolution. Mingling the material with altered states of consciousness, <coughs> cinema invokes structures of viewing in which the cinematic image, instead of simply suturing the viewer's mind and desire into seamless narratives, operates as a prosthetic limb, allowing us to touch upon topographies, objects, and histories not of our own making. Cage cinema is a cinema of embodiment and perceptual movement, a cinema offering sensory maps of the world. Like the perceptual system of Paleolithic cave artists, cinema has the potential to intensify our temporal experience and spatial stretch, to connect our senses to different times and places, to the unseen and the unheard. Images here aren't just something putting a stable frame around our vision and thus converting the world into a surface of visibility. At once map and body, the skin-like, multi-dimensional screens of cave cinema instead wanted to serve as a concentration point of various intensities and temporalities, as enchanting interfaces fusing the visual and the haptic so as to resurrect our desire to be and become other, and to literally touch upon and be transformed by a dramatically expanded reality. At once myth and media, cave cinema thus thoroughly breaks with the dominant conventions of both rectangular and framing and narrative development. First, it situates the viewer's body as something that creates the image within itself. Cave cinema seeks to enable a return of conventional cinema's request, a meeting of different rhythms and intensities in whose context psychic activity isn't purchased through physical immobilization and sensory anesthetization goes hand in hand with forms of embodiment and our sense of bodily motion. In contrast to dominant forms of spectatorship, in particular the ones conceptualized by apparatus theory, cave cinema addresses the eye not as a transparent window to the soul and the viewer's desire, but as a physical organ, as part of a body for which experiences of touch and physical motion are integral to seeing. Images here aren't external to the body. Instead, the body itself functions as a screen and skin, absorbing the world into its sensory operation. Secondly, 
rather than to draw the viewer's psychic system into the streamlined, restless, and linear time of narrative progression, Hatzog's membrane-like cinema wants to open our senses to the irresolvable overlay of different times and spaces that make up our own present. Rather than to shove the viewer forward along a narrative arc <coughs> and a relentless chain of events, cave cinema functions as a cinematic relay station, shaping our awareness for the unframed and inexpressible, the strange and other in ourselves, as much as in the world around us. It impresses on the viewer that we have no absolute authority over our own body, its senses, its temporal and spatial extensions, the images we see and produce alike. Know that we can employ this body and its images to claim authority over the perceptual field, over inner and outer nature. The body of cave cinema is unstable and defies decisive limits. It is something we can never entirely master and dominate. It is something we merely borrow from time. Breaking the self-contained frames and linear drives of narrative filmmaking, cave cinema redefines the cinematic experience as a Benjaminian room for play. It wants to allow human beings, in Miriam Hansen's words, I quote of her study of Walter Benjamin, to appropriate technology in the mode of play, that is, in a sensory somatic and non-destructive form. <coughs> the promise of Herzog's cave cinema, in other words, is to enable reciprocal relationships between percept and perceiving body. A mimetic approach to the phenomenal world based not on desires to control, frame, and dominate, but on our yearning to learn how to open ourselves up to what is beyond our control, to assimilate what is incommensurable and strange into our own perception without denying its otherness and unassimilability. <coughs> Instead of trying to force a relentless narrative and perceptual trajectory onto the viewer, cave cinema allows the viewer to rebuild the world within their own senses, to let go and slow down. The art of Sloan is here being understood as our ability to find respite from linear, temporal, and spatial orders, and, like a dreamer, experience the world of our perception as something beautifully ambivalent, enigmatic, in flux, messy, and unpredictable, as something charged with potentiality. Let me, in the last section of my presentation today, speak a bit more about Herzog's cave cinema, <coughs> raises profound questions, not only about the location and notion of art cinema today, but also about its relationship to the proliferation of screens in our environments we have witnessed over the past decade and a half. Screens are ubiquitous today. They not only transport us to different times and spaces, but have become integral part of our notion of movement and mobility today. Ten years ago, it may have been difficult to imagine what touch screens and mobile viewing devices do to our sense of bodily presence and mobility today. The way we maneuver through space, the way we may connect to other lives in mid -scale. Today, like it or not, screenscapes have become the order of the day. Life on screen, for some inexplicable reason, has come to look always more interesting than life in front of our eyes. Screens do all kinds of do all kind of living for us, structure and strain our attention in unprecedented ways, and define our mental and bodily relation to the world in such a way that no contemporary art project, eager to live up to its contemporaneity, can afford not to address the role of screens and what we know about and how we sense the world of sensible things. Screens, as also reminds us, I quote, are semi-permeable membranes through which something might pass, but they can also keep something out. They act as sieve and filter. They are rigid and solid, but they can also be movable and flexible. Screens are in effect something that stands between us and the world, something that simultaneously protects and opens up access. Cave of Forgotten Dreams might be seen as an attempt not simply to change how screens funnel and filter information, but to change our very understanding of what may count as screen in the first place. To remake and energize our perception by changing our aesthetic relationship to contemporary screen escapes in both temporal and spatial terms. It is interesting to note in this context that Herzog was recently invited 
to participate in the Whitney Biennial in New York with a project called Hearstake of the Soul, a multi-screen installation presenting and producing the graphical work and landscape etchings of Dutch 16th century artist Hathelis Sagers. While Sagers' images themselves, of course, are still images, Hathelis's camera thought to animate them by slowly panning across their surfaces. The multiple screen format added additional drama and movement to how the installation presented Zegers' visionary and at times almost surreal landscapes. <coughs> Curiously enough, the installation's soundtrack largely drew from the work of Dutch cellist and composer Ernest Reisiger, who was also mainly responsible for the musical soundtrack of Cape of Forgotten Dreams, thus setting up curious continuities between how both projects interrogated the function and promise of screens as mediums connecting to similar times and spaces. Video and installation art, such as Herzog's Hearsay of the Soul, today serves as a primary contemporary medium to install time and space. Probe duration and attentiveness in screening culture, unhinge conventional notions of temporal linearity, and invite viewers to sense their own sensing of time. We all know that the viewing of installation art on the ground differs profoundly from how cinema asks us to see and experience the world view. Visitors of media installations at first appear self-directed viewers at their best, as deliberate flaneurs who encounter moving images not much different from how YouTube users assemble their own project, objects of pleasure. As Kate Montlove writes, I quote, while the audience's expected time commitment is putatively preordained, in the case of viewing non-installation variants of film or video, or video Viewers routinely enjoy what one might call an exploratory duration in observing gallery-based media installations. That is, spectators autonomously determine the length of time they spend with their work. With the work, largely unburdened by external, externally imposed timetables, museum visitors, visitors of film and video installations <coughs> appear to be free to walk in and out at any time. End quote. Whether projected in a black box, or in a gallery's open space, whether displayed as an endless loop or as part of a scheduled medley of pieces, whether requiring single or multiple screens, video and media installation art today largely caters to viewers often unable or unwilling to take in the whole. The medium itself may in theory facilitate unprecedented potentials of modulating and stretching the temporal. In actual practice, however, its viewers may often simply dip in and out of given installation pieces, we just saw them, uh, at random intervals, their temporal investments radically deviating from the particular demands of a work's formal structure. This is not the place to discuss how Herzog's hearsay of the soul aspired to pause the speed and restlessness of the roaming spectator of today's video installation art. What I want to indicate in closing, however, is the extent to which we must see cinematic projects such as Cave of Forgotten Dreams and multiple screen installations such as Hearsay of the Soul as parts of the very continuum we must understand as art cinema today. Art cinema being understood as medium and institution to interrogate the way in which images and screens today shape our temporal and spatial relationships to the world. A few decades ago, Art cinema was easy to be identified. We mostly talked about slow and pondering films, difficult <coughs> films, films void of real narrative, void of spectacle, films that deliberately thought to frustrate the viewer in the hopes of turning such frustration into creative energy and spectatorial activity. Art cinema happened in local art house theaters and on college campuses. It revolved around the names of various mostly European auteurs, and it involved viewers whose tastes were refined as much as they were often quite predictable. Teach a course on art cinema a few decades ago, and you knew exactly what kind of customer you might find in your class. Then were either students eager to dig their teeth into the very kind of stuff no one else would ever watch, or people looking for some legitimate reason to take a good nap during prolonged <laughs> screen sessions. Though many might see him as an anachronistic leftover from an earlier moment of film history and art cinema, as a mere specter of the past. Werner Herzog's diverse work in recent years is a good case in point to recognize the extent to which art cinema today comes in the plural. It can be found in classical art house theaters, festival programs, streaming libraries, and museum galleries. 
as much as it makes its appearance on various platforms of dig digital image manipulation and dissemination, including the internet and even mobile phone displays. <coughs> what unifies art cinema is the effort to probe our relationship to mediated images, to reframe the framing of the real, to investigate and recalibrate the way in which dominant screen cultures today have come to modulate time and spatial relationships. Whether it descends into prehistoric caves or conjures 16th century landscapes of the mind, whether it places us in dark auditoriums or in half-lit gallery spaces, whether it draws on the immersive effects of 3D or on the refractive visuality of multiple screen installations, art cinema today is at its best whenever it invites us to question the technological determinism of contemporary screen and interface culture head on and allows us to explore wondrous framings and unframings of the world as promises to see and sense past and future in a new light. Like cave cinema, like the humanities in general, art cinema today happens and is at its best whenever it invites us to take time to engage with the very nature of time. Whenever it delays and pauses automatic visions of progress so as to make us experience and reflect on how different technologies and media shape and expand our sense of time and history. Thank you for your attention. So we have about half an hour, so if you have questions, then uh, you should be free to ask them. Uh, Herzog uses the same cinematic devices found in contemporary cinema, wide shots, medium shots, close-ups. He edits sequences and creates a sense of flow of information. So, in what ways does cave cinema use those things uniquely that are cave cinema and not traditional cinema? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, thank you. Um, what I present here as cave cinema is kind of a theoretic construction that kind of elaborates on some of the things that I, I observed in this project. So, it's not that he's out there trying to make cave cinema, I kind of construct it on the top of it. And yes, you're um, quite right. He, he, he clearly sort of uses a number of quite familiar techniques. Nothing new really about that. What is quite interesting about this project is really that hmm, we have a lot of 3D projects these days that are just made for the purpose, I mean, even sort of redoing older films in order to get just crowds into the cinema for that kind of sensory experience, for sort of that added thrill, basically. Um, this project, Cave, uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, from the very, very beginning seems to be a project where 3D cinematography seems absolutely central to what he's actually doing there. That he's sort of exploring the continuity between the two, or the kind of echoes between the two. So it is, he's dealing with images that are three-dimensional, he's dealing with images that are sort of because rock images and um, sort of meant to also sort of evoke some sense of spirituality that kind of come out of the rock and have sort of this expanded um, uh, dimension to them. He sort of embraces 3D as the most adequate form to actually come, come to represent or sort of come to uh, allow us to get in touch with these kind of images. And so the way he therefore brings 3D cameras into this very unlikely spot comes with that kind of intention, you know, to, to really do something with 3D that isn't just thrill, that isn't just sort of at its spectrum. Now there are some moments in this film, and uh, I didn't um, talk about those, but we could sort of talk about some of the ones I, I screened as well, where he's actually um, employing some, some rather unique strategies. Um, there's this one extended sequence where he asks everyone to be quiet. Uh, for those who saw the film this week or at an earlier moment, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like seven minutes or so. It's actually the sequence, I think, that was running in the background. So we have uh, sort of seven or eight scientists in the, um, sort of in the cave there, and he asks them to be just quiet, and then camera starts to just go over their faces and then it shows us the walls. Um, and eventually, actually, um, in this quiet, and it's very difficult to be that quiet for, for, these, uh, for these people. Um, and it's kind of staged, I mean, it's not just, so just be quiet, so we see. 
but then all of a sudden he actually fades in the sound of a, of a heartbeat. Um, it comes sort of, uh, sort of acoustically in the background. And it's a very unsettling uh, experience actually for us as a viewer, because we can't quite locate where that heartbeat is actually coming from. Um, and there's sort of the acoustical dimension of does something to the images that is very, very unsettling. Because all of a sudden we kind of feel as a viewer that the heart, is it our heart? Is it a heart that we hear? Whose heart are we hearing? So the, the sound does something to our way of relating bodily to the image that's very unsettling. <coughs> I feel that sort of this film has many of those moments where he actually does something with 3D that isn't just sort of as in commercial CD, sort of that moment where something is thrown at us and we're just like sort of thrown, thrown away, kind of shocked basically by the, the um, sort of, um, uh, three dimensional properties of the image. But he kind of rather pulls us in and pushes us out, and that does some, some things that are quite, quite unsettling in that respect. And I'd say he, he's exploring some some elements that, that go beyond sort of a traditional style. And you keep in mind though that I mean, this was a small project. Um, I think it's funded by the, the History Channel, in fact. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of a made for TV, not a white project, but sort of for a smaller distribution, but picked up some speed and picked up some uh, popularity, and therefore got to buy all audiences. We didn't have sort of the massive amount of uh, technology at his disposal that James Cameron had from making Avatar. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, this is not a fully thought out question, yeah. but it's about something that I think you touch on, but uh, I'd like to invite you to say more yeah. about, which is the extremely privileged status that Herzog has in being allowed to descend into the depths of this place that's ever after, yeah. sealed to us, and be the kind of ancient mariner to come back out and tell the world the story of yeah. the part of the Earth's body that only technology now can attest to, much like medical technology, which might tell us about the genome sequence yeah, yeah. or something. And you've talked a bit about prosthetics and uh, the kind of bodily experience of cave cinema. And this seems to me a potential bridge to a, a kind of bodily mm -hmm. secret of the earth in an almost ecological way that is unique yeah. to this. Do you think that there are ramifications here for echo politics and I don't know, science and, and history in, in a, a way that's specific to the story of this, of the caves, and, and his privileged recounting of it, uh, his, uh, his sort of testimony to it. Yeah. That's, that's not, it's, it's it's not a good question. question. I mean, no, so it's it not really not opens up a, a wide range of possible responses. I mean, first of all, in the, <coughs> you're really right. I mean, sort of, he's also in the film itself, sort of emphasizing, well, has a loves to do that. I mean, he kind of performs those, he relishes those moments yeah. when he has to yeah. emphasize the danger or the difficulty to get somewhere, you know. When we have sort of those first sequences when he descends into, we all have to see how difficult and how challenging and how dangerous and probably potentially death-threatening it is to sort of just go into the sequence and he has to kind of perform that for us. So that is sort of a, a classical kind of half yeah. moment. But um, <coughs> is there sort of a larger yeah. topic of kind of how to relate the human and the non-human in this, and I would say yes. I mean, I, I think I call it whatever. But what, what terms do you sort of an echo? I think it, it may have to do with echo politics in a yeah. very profound way, but mm -hmm. I don't know how. I mean, echo politics in the sense of exploring a different notion of maybe subjectivity. Yeah, the body and the earth mm -hmm. in this different relation, yeah. mediated by cinema as the only way in now, right. this secret part closed mm -hmm. otherwise. That we need sort of certain types of technological devices to explore, to actually reduce the sense of control that sort of in particular the Western notion of subjectivity has produced in the subject over centuries and thereby sort of this kind of experience becomes an experience that recalibrates the relation of the human to the non-human or the subject to the object is, is certainly there which brings us, and this is the thing I really don't want to comment about because I really can't make head or tails out of this the final <laughs> sequence of this film when we have the two white albino <laughs> crocodiles and alligators look at each other uh, with the suggestion that some of this may have been produced by the nuclear factory that is sort of right around it and some really crazy stuff is happening there that I don't have a good sort of explanation for, but it sort of resonates a little bit mm -hmm. with, with what you what you say. Probably use that sequence in order to no, come to a more sort of yeah. conclusive statement on this, but I'm not sure I want to get this because <laughs> it's a 
very enigmatic moment of the room. Yeah. So you connected the 3D elements of modern culture and sort of the ubiquitousness of that to the his use of 3D being necessary to to the images that mm -hmm. he's presenting, and then also the connection to the shamanistic activity yeah, that may yeah. or may not have produced these images and the space being important to the screen. Mm -hmm. Would you consider movie theaters today as sort of a spiritual space similar to the cave? <laughs> the modern day movie theater as a spiritual space. This is probably where Hatsuk wants you to go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would consider it like this, but um, uh, that um, sort of the vision of a cinema <laughs> that does more than just the consumption of images is driving this project and um, exactly what the nature of spiritualism might be. Leave that open, but he's sort of toying with this idea of the auditorium as a, a very different space than the one we have uh, we've gotten used to. Yeah. I'm not quite sure where that would get us in the long run, but um, I think he's, he's clearly wants us to relate differently to, the, to what we call screen than sort of the, the regular spectatorial position in the theater, as we know. And that sort of gets us yeah. in, into that direction. Yeah. Maybe sort of spiritualism or sort of eco-politics. It'd be interesting to think about the relation of them, those two to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, as I mentioned, it's sort of a long tradition of film theory, if I understand it, I have sort of some acoustic problems, okay. but um, sort of a long sort of tradition of, of film theory that tries to think about the relationship of the cinematic auditorium and the cave, in particular, sort of in light of Plato's um, sort of philosophical understanding of the cave, with the um, sort of disembodied viewer basically being fooled by the images that are reflected on the cave wall that come from the outside, but kind of uh, immobilize us in the inside. Now, uh, the argument I try to pursue is actually that we want to think not just about the, the, this analogy between cave and cinema uh, along multiple lines. So that, that older tradition, that older theoretical model, model is rather confining. I think where Hatzik wants to take us is somewhere else. It's actually sort of energizing in many respects. It's not emphasizing spectatorial immobilization, passivity, just sort of frontalness in that respect, but sort of something else. Um, and again, I would say that that is sort of an important element. At the same time, so of course, a kind of auditorium he has in mind, hmm, with his emphasis, if the element of, of touch, of haptic experience, kind of central, as I've tried to argue, in this notion of cave cinema, there's something that we don't have right now. It's hard for us to imagine what that actually might mean. Um, but he's kind of toying with the idea that cinema isn't just about viewing and opticality, but it involves sort of the sense of, of haptics, of, sort of tactical engagement, of somatic exchanges. We have a time right now, we have cinema auditoriums that are very optical, but uh, somatic through sound. I mean, like um, big blockbuster films, I mean, they, they work a lot on us actually through sound on our bodies. I mean, you feel it. I mean, you, the, 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 the loudness and the, the musical soundtracks, they really deeply penetrate our bodies on a new level. But we have sort of a more optical cinema here, and then of course we have sort of the development of touch screens left and right, sort of on the other side. Right? But those two don't really go together. I think what we see in Herzog is sort of, at this particular junction of screen culture development, an attempt to think cinema in touch screen in the widest sense, you know? And uh, together, 
and they were also complicating our sense of what a touch screen might be. Because our conventional understanding of what a touch screen is today is it's a very instrumental kind of thing. We want something from that touch screen. You know? I mean, when we, when we do something, it's, it's a very instrumental gesture. We always tip, tap on something because we want exactly that kind of thing. And sort of what you call the, the eco-politics of this project, or sort of the spiritualism of the project, of course envisions a kind of subjectivity that doesn't always want something. That is those sort of always instrumental in that. So envision a touch screen actually that does something to us rather than us doing something to that. And then you get closer to what hats of my have in mind here. <laughs> but we don't have it. It's just a sort of utopia. <laughs> so, yeah. Look, there actually is fashion being designed, which includes <coughs> touch screen on it and mm -hmm. electronic display that fashion. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there are a number of designers who are working on objects to be worn that incorporate this, so it might be there yeah. that some of this is uh, I can't happening. wait for the moment when they build cell phones that are fully integrated into the body and that don't have every morning so it's virtual cell phones Because to <laughs> 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 we carry them everywhere with their touch screens, but we also lose them everywhere. Right. <laughs> they should be right here. Soon. Yeah. Um, I come from a more art history background. Yeah. There's, again, there's sort of not one notion, and this has kind of historically shifted. We're looking back at um, the earlier moments in history, I mean, sort of Hitchcock, say post-war, general post-war periods, or war period post-war periods. I guess there was a relatively expectable notion of what art cinema is. It's a sort of non-commercial cinema, it's actually a cinema <coughs> that tries to not be Hollywood, and thereby also, at least from an American perspective, becomes a kind of national cinema. We talk about German cinema, we talk about French cinema, whenever they try to actually not be Hollywood and make, with the help of an auteur, with the help of sort of a strong director who sort of leaves his imprint, mostly his imprint, who are ultimately sort of females, sort of allowed in that kind of moment, leave their imprint sort of on the whole cinematic experience. So the sort of older notion of art cinema was quite tied to actually the notion also of national cinema. Although it resulted in overlooking all the popular films that were also shot, say, in France or in Germany or in Italy at the same time. Um, I think that older notion of, of art cinema as a project to confront Hollywood, to do something that Hollywood doesn't do, and to kind of ground <coughs> uh, cinematic production and reception within kind of national context independent of Hollywood, is kind of worn out. And the due to all kinds of technological developments, historical developments, the fact that Hollywood isn't just Hollywood anymore, it's sort of many things too. Um, you can't sort of unify it just as a commercial product. And so what we're, I'm sort of at the stage where I want to suggest some, some newer concepts of what, what art cinema could be. And for me, um, sort of art cinema um, becomes that site where moving image culture, let's make this kind of open, moving image culture starts to reflect and address the role of screens and moving images and their sort of temporal and spatial dimensions in many respects. Sort of where um, so the cinema, moving image cuts are very actively tries to, to reflect and do something with itself. Um, and, um, and in particular, at this juncture, uh, it makes us think more and view more and sense more about our sense of time. I know that's a sort of very fuzzy notion in many respects, but um, I want to keep it somewhat fuzzy because we find art cinema in so many different, or what could possibly be art cinema in so many different places, and particularly in a situation where it's sort of a great place to actually talk about this, where uh, film directors these days often make video art installations, and sort of artists that traditionally work mostly for the museum or the gallery actually all of a sudden make films that show in theaters. You know, those, those boundaries have become very fluid, and we need to kind of have new concepts that we don't fully have them in order to account for. So, um, <coughs> not a very satisfying answer, but I think so there's, there's a lot of future work that needs to be done in order to bring that concept back. Because the concept itself was a little, um, had a bad reputation for a while. Because art cinema sounds like sort of that 
stuff that the kind of elitist, kind of elitist, non-popular, kind of nationalistic at times, and we need to get out of that box. I hope, with in particular one book project, I mean, I'm, I could, can contribute to get it into a more productive box. Could you simplify it to say that art cinema is that that which is reflexive compared to purely for Yeah, we, we, would have, we, would have to, we would have to talk about what sort of a reflexive means, because it's a reflexive in, in all the discussions about art cinema, it's also meant to be a very sort of cognitive process. So it really gives you a certain kind of distance so you can rigorously think through what is happening. Um, this is a reflexive project, but Herzog is not a thinker. You know, he actually makes us, and makes us kind of feel and sense some of these things. We're sort of starting to allow reflexivity to cover that ground as well kind of remodel our sense of time or our sort of sense, sensory dimensions of how to relate with the world and how to relate to media, then maybe reflexive is a good word. But yeah, good point. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so last Sunday when the uh, Rush showed the movie, immediately um, after the movie there was a public discussion mm -hmm. on the film. And a significant section of the discussion was devoted to the red, the, to those red hand prints. Yeah. And uh, what was interesting in a lot of this discussion is that you completely reversed the conclusions of that okay. discussion. <laughs> so it seemed like most of the audience wanted uh, two, two points. And yeah. most of the audience wanted to see this precisely as a sign of absolute individuality. Mm -hmm. Finally, because of the crooked little finger, yeah. we have proved that an actual human being drew these things, that there's a continuity among the images, and you emphasize precisely this fact that you want to um, reinterpret this tactile um, experience as an um, impersonal experience almost, that it's, mm -hmm. the, it's not the fetishism of the signature that counts. Right, yeah. At the same time, you also made another comment that I thought was interesting in connection with this, is that most people wanted to see all of the um, images as fundamentally figurative representations. Mm -hmm. And most of the discussion, um, even the paleontologists or archeologists who appear, put the emphasis on the birth of the human spirit by figurative representation. Yeah. But when it's first introduced, it's called the red dots. Non-figurative, red dots on the world. Right, it's right. a purely abstract. And you seem to suggest, uh, if I understood it, that you also would almost see that uh, particular panel as a, an abstract representation rather than a, a figurative, namely a screensaver. You know, just, you know, <laughs> things appearing rather than a figurative representation. So if you add these two, your two reversers of the, uh, popular, you know, recession of this uh, particular scene, then would you say that cave cinema is decidedly impersonal and abstract? I mean, is that the direction? Are you desubjectivizing in a certain sense this experience? Because you're deleting the, um, um, sort of the signature, mm -hmm. but you're not deleting Werner's Herzog's signature, but the, um, that whoever, that uh, man or woman, that was a debate in the movie whether it was a man or a woman, He's too tall, according yeah, to one archaeologist, to be a woman. Yeah. But because of the crooked little finger, you're trying to suggest that, okay, that's not the most important part of this. Right, right. No, that, I'm not entirely sure it's entirely persuasive, but it's sort of a suggestion. I mean, the, 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 the most intuitive response to that is, in particular, with a pretty big ego filmmaker like Werner Herzog, that this is sort of <laughs> all difficult. about like, looking for authorial signatures. You know, here's, here's an imprint of the maker like I'm the big maker of making this, I mean, we know all that story. And, and I, I, can, I can see people wanting to go that way with that. But so in light of what I try to construct as the notion of cave cinema, it seems to, to me to really suggest, yeah, I guess the opposite, right? Impersonal might not be quite the right term, because it's, it's, it's really, um, well, it's an, it's an index, it is a mark, but it's, it's an index of a relationship between flesh and rock, mm -hmm. Right, that stood in the service of actually releasing something from the rock or behind it in the spiritual interpretation um, that the, the conjurer can't fully control. And so it, it becomes the mark or the index of a, of a relationship that hmm, took a certain sense of subjectivity or person <coughs> out of that touch of, you know. Impersonal sounds like a negative to something that I think I mean more positive, but is ultimately, I guess, what I would describe as aesthetic experience, so the opening up of the body to something unexpected and incommensurable somehow. 
you know, not sort of a relationship to the object world that is instrumental and goal oriented. You know? and, and so that I see, so in a way it's not the deliberate signature someone leaves, but it's a mark of the fact that there was an aesthetic experience that opened up the world rather than closed it down towards um, the control. Um, abstraction, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. I need to okay. think about that because um, there are probably too, diff too, too many different means. In particular, I went through the show of this, this, this morning here, which think is about it. beautiful, sort of different, um, really makes you rethink sort of what abstraction could all mean uh, in, in art and sort of in, in culture in general. And, um, with all the, uh, with the sort of different emphases on the line and the, the core and the beyond the core and after the core and um, we sort of we've had probably have to clarify what we mean with that. So um, I'm hesitant to answer that. Okay, but we can talk about it. It's a good question. Yeah. The images in that cave were made over thousands of years, mm -hmm. so it's pretty hard yeah. to say that there's one particular focus of intent mm -hmm. between dots and handprints. Mm -hmm. You know Willem Warrior's uh, notion of empathy and abstraction? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Try to relate that to the, to, to, to the question that that fellow just asked. Mm -hmm. Can you? Well, uh, Warrior says that in certain cultures at certain times tend towards abstraction when right. they are removed from their emotional core and at other times they're more involved with image making because they're more emotionally involved with society and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. and so if cultures move through uh, representation to abstraction depending on how the culture perceives its members and relationships to yeah. those members with yeah. their art and their politics and their laws and their societal relationships, mm -hmm. it would hold true that something that's created over maybe an eight or 10,000 year span would also move through different yeah. Uh, notions of relationship mm -hmm. between the image and what that image re uh, intends. Right, right. That's a, that's a great suggestion, actually. So think of that in kind of boring, Gary terms. Um, on, on some level, I mean, boring himself, so it came out of a, an intellectual tradition in the second half of the 19th century, often sort of called empathy theory, um, that thought a lot about um, the relationship of the body to a particular sculpture. Uh, and how um, through, through movements and through um, yeah, I guess te a tactile or haptic relationships is called we call it to life in the first place in our own body and, and uh, some of that thought could be actually used in various ways to, to bring to bear on, uh, on Hatsip as well which is a great suggestion that, that would get us probably to a better answer to the abstraction question as well Okay, I think we should probably end here. It's five till seven. Uh, we have to be out of here by seven. Um, so, thank you. Let's. Thank you. I suppose if anyone has a question still, like you can also ask him outside. You know, I'm sure that Lutz will be happy to address it.